Welcome everyone. Let us know where you're joining us from in the chat. We're happy to have you here today. All right, we are going to go ahead. Oh, we got Santa Cruz, Georgia. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. I'm Dion Aminata, Director of Strategic Initiatives at Illustrative Mathematics, and one of the lead authors of the IMK5 Math Curriculum. I am really excited for today's topic because we get to talk about the importance of families and family engagement in math instruction. This is the final webinar in our Experience IMK5 Math webinar series. And I cannot emphasize enough how impactful these discussions have been. Before we close today, I'll show you how to find our previous sessions that are now available on demand. And we've had some brilliant panelists discussing some critical topics and today's panel will not disappoint. We have been leaning, leaning into the topic of equity in math instruction every step of the way. And we cannot have a complete conversation about equity in education without talking about the contributions that families make to the lived experiences and the wealth of knowledge all students bring to the math classroom as they engage in learning new math, con new math concepts and solving problems. Unfortunately, due, due to an unanticipated conflict, Dr. Catherine Ye will not be joining us for the panel discussion today, and we wish her well. Before we get to our illustrious panel, we will be joined by I Am Certified Facilitator and I Am Parent, Robin Moore, who will take us through some of the supports for families we have at I Am, and she will demo how I Am K-5 Math provides teachers with opportunities to invite students to use their funds of knowledge during math instruction. During today's webinar, please feel free to use the chat feature to make comments and ask questions directly to our panelists and the Q&A feature to ask questions about our materials. This event has been made accessible through live captioning. To gain access to captions, click on live transcript, the icon in your Zoom screen menu and select show subtitles. If you're a Twitter user, tag us at Illustrate Math and use the hashtag learn with I am to share your enthusiasm with us. To share just how important families are to I am, let's listen to a message from Bill McCallum, co-founder and CEO of Illustrative Mathematics. Hello, everybody. Very happy to welcome you all to the last webinar in our series about I am K5 Math. This one's about family engagement. And that's really super important because at Illustrative Mathematics, we want students to learn math for life. We do this with this problem-based approach to instruction, which means students work on problems, share their thinking, talk about the mathematics, bring their own experiences. So they bring things from outside the classroom, and then when they go home, they share their thinking with their caregivers, with their families, uh, and that sharing, talking about mathematics is really an important part of their learning. Particularly uh, in the last couple of years, families have really had to step up to the plate and, and help their students because uh, all the vagaries of distance learning, hybrid learning have meant that there are gaps to be filled. Uh, we produced a series of images called I Am Talking Math, where there would be an image to look at and a prompt um, of discussion with kids to try and help families through that. Um, the other thing I want to say is that I know that often there's some anxiety about mathematics. Um, not every uh, family, not every caregiver had a happy experience with mathematics as children. And especially also because of our problem-based curriculum, sometimes what the students are doing doesn't look familiar. It's because we're trying to have students engage in activities that help them understand the why of the mathematics they're doing, not just the how. That said, the mathematics hasn't changed. Caregivers have a lot to contribute. They bring their knowledge, students share their knowledge, and that family connection is really what's gonna help students in the end learn math for life. 
Yes, learn math for life. That's the tagline and that's why we do the work. Thank you so much, Bill, for that message. Um, Bill's message also reminds me of this quote from the 2013 book, Impact of Identity in K-8 Mathematics by Aguirre, Martin, and Mayfield Ingram. It says, all students, in light of their humanity, their personal experiences, backgrounds, histories, languages, phys and physical and emotional well-being, we must have the opportunity and support to learn rich mathematics that fosters meaning making, empowers decision making, and critiques challenges and transforms inequities and injustices. There are some amazing things we can do with mathematics when we allow students to bring their whole selves to each lesson. When we empower students to explore mathematics in the world that surrounds them, they can eventually use mathematics to advocate for themselves, their families, their communities, and make a difference in the world. To dig deeper into how I am is taking on this charge, it is my pleasure to introduce I am certified professional learning facilitator, Robin Moore. Robin began her journey in education over 20 years ago as an elementary classroom teacher. She is a, currently a lead curriculum renewal coordinator and professional, pre pre oh, sorry, professional development specialist at EdAdvance, one of Connect Connecticut's six regional educational service centers. She's also an educational consultant for exemplars. Robin is a mom of two teenagers the youngest happens to be currently using IM in middle school. Welcome, Robin. Thank you so much, Deanne. I'm so excited to be here to share resources with families, but also to listen to our panelists this afternoon. Let me just get my screen. All right. So I want to start off by sharing how students feel when they're invited to the mathematics. They're excited to bring who they are to the community, and they're excited about what they know connects to what they're learning about. When we invite students to bring who they are and what they know to the mathematical community, we have the opportunity to build upon and leverage the funds and knowledge that each student brings. When we leverage and build upon the funds and knowledge that each student brings to the classroom, we position each student as a capable and competent author of important mathematical ideas. And when we invite students to bring who they are and what they know to the mathematical community, build upon their funds and knowledge and position them as capable and competent authors of important mathematical ideas, we offer each student access to grade level mathematics. So this slide illustrates how IM's curriculum purposely invites students to the mathematics through its curriculum design. It's also designed to give all students opportunities to go deeper with the content as they study concepts and procedures. This design structure can be seen at the course level, unit, lesson, and activity level. At every level, we have explicitly embedded invitations to the curriculum. Teachers can use these opportunities to allow students to bring their own knowledge and experiences to the lesson, make connections between what they know and the content that they're learning, and gain access to grade level mathematics. So let's see how this happens with a warm up from one of our lessons. This happens to be one of our routines that we start our lessons off with during a warm up called estimation exploration. When we start these off, we like to connect with our students by hearing about their personal connections and hearing their stories. So for this warm up, which happens in third grade, we might start off by asking our students if they've ever seen a ladybug before or asking them to think about is it smaller or bigger than their hands? Um, how about their finger or even their nail? So I invite you right now to maybe get a piece of paper and to think about an estimate that would be just right for this ladybug. So you can go ahead and write that down. And now that you have that estimate, that just right estimate in your mind and perhaps have written it down, I invite you to think about an estimate that would be too high. And I'd like you to type this into our chat box. So this is what we do with our students. Um, we have them first think about a just right estimate, and then we think about an estimate that's too high. 
So I'm seeing folks typing in answers. I'm seeing one inch, I'm seeing a half inch coming in as answers. Some are even talking about feet. I now want us to go to the other end of the spectrum and think about an estimate that would be too low. And you can go ahead and type your too low estimate into the chat box now. So I'm seeing folks talking about an eighth of an inch, a tenth of an inch, a millimeter, a centimeter. And as our students are brainstorming these estimates that are too high and too low, we would have them justify and explain why they know that they have to be too high or why these estimates have to be too low as well. I now invite you to go back and look at that original estimate that you had that was just right. And I want you to think about whether you want to stay with that estimate or do you want to revise it? And I invite you to type into the chat box your about right estimate. Go ahead. What estimate did you have that's about right? What do you think? So I'm seeing lots of folks are saying a quarter inch. All right, thank you. Some said a third of an inch. And we would have our students justify and share with us how they know that those estimates are a quarter of an inch, or I'm seeing three eighths of an inch and share with us. I also am wondering if any of you changed your estimate from your original estimate after going through this activity. And we would ask our students the same thing. After talking about our estimates that are too high and too low, helps our students to learn to be more precise and to zero in on that exact estimate. So often students will revise and we talk about that revision process that we go through. Oh, I have someone right now is saying, wait, maybe 5 16th. So it sounds like maybe they're going through some revision as well. Thank you for sharing. This lesson leads into a lesson about comparing fractions for our third graders. So I want you to think about how does this estimation exploration routine invite students to bring who they are and what they know into the classroom community. I invite you to share your ideas in the chat box. Seeing that, that students can change their thinking along the way. Everyone's able to share their personal experiences. They can talk about whether they've seen a ladybug in their life, right? So there's entry points for everyone. Um, there's not one right answer. Everyone's um, um, responses are valued and heard. They can learn from each other. Thank you for sharing your ideas. I want to now talk to you about how families can partner with teachers to help reinforce mathematics with the materials that we have to offer. So one of the things that IM has is the family support letters. These are fabulous because they're available for each unit and they provide summaries that help families preview and review math content. Some of you might be aware of those already, perhaps teachers are sending them home. We also have, which you heard about a little bit so far with when Bill was sharing earlier about our I Am Talking Math series. These provide daily grade level problems that you can use to engage your, your children at home. And then our third thing that I'm gonna be sharing with you is about our free access to centers. You may have seen some of these coming home or perhaps hearing about how your, your students are already engaging in these in the classroom. Let's take a look at some of these materials. So the family support materials share with you strategies and representations that your students are using in the classroom. Here's a sample of a kindergarten support material um, letter that might go home that would share with you about different materials they're using in the classroom. So we see here how students might be using connecting cubes, pattern blocks. We see here something that's called a five frame that you may or may not be familiar with as well as geo blocks. So they're using these things to enter into concepts. So you would be aware of what they're doing in the classroom. And then one of my favorite pieces is this family engagement section, which talks about what you can do at home with your children. So we see here ideas and most importantly, questions we can ask. Sometimes we're not sure about how to help our children at home, but we can always ask great questions. So they give us some great question prompts. And this is especially important I find for our older students. So sometimes we're wondering about 
how do we help our older students? So we're not sure how to help, but we don't need to necessarily be able to know what to do to help, but we certainly can ask some really great questions. So you'll see here, we can ask our older students, can you draw a diagram to help solve? Can you explain the steps of your algorithm? And then they give us great representations here to help us better understand what they're doing. Um, we know that the standard algorithm is often a hot topic for families. And so this family letter provides an explanation of how the steps for multiplying multi-digit numbers are broken down conceptually. As students learn the algorithm, which is required by the end of grade five, they're encouraged to draw diagrams and explain the steps. And this letter shares how families can do that at home to reinforce that practice. And what's nice is that in grades three and four, we see the same thing to support families with that algorithm when they're working on it for addition and subtraction. Let me share with you about the I am talking map. So I love this because we have these beautiful photos that engage students in mathematics. And so we see here these adorable puppies in this photo, and there's this great prompt. This prompt happens to be aligned to the work in grade one, but they use the same images and we can actually find a problem from kindergarten all the way up through grade five that would align with the same photo. So you may have children in multiple grades and your family, you can have your kiddos all within your family looking at the same photo, but have a different question that applies to the grade level work that they're working on. And the last thing I wanna share with you is about our free access to centers. So this is a great way to help students develop those conceptual concepts, as well as um, working on their, their fluency, developing their fluency skills. This happens to be a sample of one of the center games that students can play called Mystery Number. So we see the directions for the game, as well as um, important vocabulary cueing that's going to help students really understand what fractions are, understanding the fractions as a number that's going to help them have a deeper understanding and to develop that fluency that's needed. So we've looked at a lot of things this afternoon in a short period of time. I'm curious, what family resources are you most excited about? You can go ahead and share in that chat box. So I'm seeing centers, the I am talking math, family support letters. So looks like there's something for everybody out there. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Dion, and I'm excited for our panelists. So thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. And if you all haven't experienced our professional learning, just know that our I am certified facilitators are pretty phenomenal. And that was amazing, Robin, thank you. Um, next up is our panel. It is time to introduce our formidable panel of math educators, family engagement experts, and yes, we have an I am parent on the panel. First up, Kanika Turner. Kanika is a 23-year veteran educator who resides in Charlotte, North Carolina. She currently serves the local math education community as an independent math consultant. Kanika is the grade four lead author of IMK5 Math and continues to serve the national math community as an IM certified facilitator. I told y'all they were brilliant. Kanika is committed to revising the negative narratives of math educators and learners as one of the co and as one of the co-founders of hashtag Black Women Rock Math. She is also committed to positioning Black and Brown women and girls as brilliant mathematical minds. Welcome, Kanika. Michael Ramirez is the senior coordinator of school Transforma transformation with the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools, where he supports the math teaching and learning at 10 elementary schools. He spent 19 years as an elementary school teacher in South Los Angeles, where he witnessed firsthand the immense challenges that students face the significant growth that children can make in one year, and how teachers have the ability to change the trajectory of students' lives. Welcome, Michael. Sarah Martin 
is an elementary math coach for P Portland Public Schools in Portland, Maine. Since 2004, she has been an English language teacher. She taught middle school for nine years and elementary for six years before becoming a math coach. In her three years as a coach, she's been able to use her experience as an English language teacher to serve at the school level where the multilingual student population is nearly 45%. Sarah is a co-chair of the Instructional Leadership Committee and a membership of a membership, a member of the leadership team. Welcome. Vanity Jenkins is the founding executive director of Citizens of the World Cincinnati, a public, public community school with an emphasis on developing the whole child. She's also the founder and lead consultant at Shifted Consulting, a full service consulting firm that is dedicated to helping organizations create an equitable environment devoid of anti-Blackness. We could have had a whole hour with Vanity based on that experience alone, but she also brings to the panel her perspective as a mother of a brilliant first grader who is using IMK5 math. Welcome Vanity. Vidya Sundaram is the co-founder and CEO of Family Engagement Lab. Over her nearly 20 year career in family engagement, she has managed development, research and strategy for digital resources used by more than half of US families with school aged children. She previously worked at great schools where she led research and insights and championed a test and learn culture across the organization. Vidya also has an extensive background in software engineering and technology project management with a specific purpose of engaging diverse partners and implement, implementing and studying digital programs. Welcome Vidya. So I'm not going to keep you any longer. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can see these beautiful faces. And I'm gonna ask our first question. Please share with our audience your role in improving school family collaboration and why you think this work is important. And we're gonna start with Michael. Thanks for having me here, Dion. Um, in the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools where I work as a math coordinator, we, we view family engagement as a crucial and essential part of our work. Uh, some of the ways that we prioritize family engagement um, is that we have specific uh, and consistent classes for families called Parent College, where they're given um, specific strategies for how to support their child's education. We have a full day event called University Day, where we help families understand how to help their kids get to and through college. And we have consistent communication that goes out to, to families that tell them, as well as the students themselves, whether they are on track for college based on various metrics like grades, attendance, reading level, math scores. Um, and that goes uh, out throughout the child's K through 12 career. Um, our goal is to get to a place where school and, and parents are actually working as true partners in the school students' education. Um, now, the reason that this work is, is so important, um, it, it's very personal to me because as a classroom teacher in South Los Angeles, where I spent almost two decades, my years of greatest success occurred when I was able to leverage families as full partners in their child's education. Um, engaging families as partners is something that's often viewed as as extra work by schools and teachers. And, and don't get me wrong, it, it's absolutely true. It does take extra work, but um, you know, a little investment goes a long way. You know, I saw firsthand how you know, working as partners with, with families increased the rate and the depth of learning for my students, as well as decrease the number of behavior issues in my class. So in many ways, the, the work that I put into engaging parents really made my job significantly easier. And I think that's true wherever teachers are able to leverage families as true partners. So thanks for having me here, Dion. Absolutely, and thank you for being here. Um, next up, we have Vanity. Uh, very similar to a lot of what Michael shared, um, student success is uh, often dependent on the level 
of um, engagement that families are having with the school on a consistent basis. I think it's critically important for us to not only view parents as partners, but to um, acknowledge and name the fact that they are children's first teachers. Um, they are the ones who are with uh, their children for most of the time. And we've seen that even more pronounced because of the impacts of COVID where parents were actually having uh, to teach their children. Um, and I know teaching my daughter math for kindergarten was a struggle for me because I didn't know what she was supposed to know and thought she should have been doing things that she wasn't doing. And so we really have to um, approach the conversation or the ideals around parent engagement in a different way because parents bring so much to the table and we often forget that. Um, to Michael's point, when you have really strong family engagement, you do see a decrease in behavior issues. You see students who are performing better on exams. You see students who are graduating at higher rates. And so really making sure that we are thinking about parents, not only in the manner of what can they do for us, um, but how can we truly and holistically partner with them is something that I think is critically important. Um, in terms of how I engage in this work, we um, bring parents to the table as often as possible. Um, our parents are actually getting ready to do a curriculum audit of both our math and our uh, ELA curriculum at the school um, to decide if we are going to continue using it. We don't think that that's a decision that should only be um, based off of what the school needs, but we also want to get their honest feedback around uh, the supports that the curriculum does have for families. Is that what families need? Do families need something else? Um, and so we try to really partner authentically with our families as much as possible. Thank you so much. Sarah? Great. Thank you. Um, so for me, often, um, often throughout my years as a teacher during family conferences, I would be told you are the second parent. And while I absolutely appreciated the sentiment, I don't think I fully um, appreciated or understood what it really meant early on. So at first I thought this was um, that I was just a stand in for the hours that their child was in school. And I was that responsible adult for them at that time. But as I became a parent myself, and as I grew my years of experience, I came to value this as the important as an important relationship between caregivers um, and the school. And what makes it true um, and work is the communication, uh, listening, opportunities for listening, and opportunities for learning and growing together. Uh, as a teacher, I also have had the privilege of learning about the brilliance of the students, um, who they are, who are they becoming, and I get to share that awesome role just like the family members do. So that to me is a huge privilege. And so now as a coach and as a former L teacher, during these family conferences and informal conversations with families and the email communication and, um, and the occasional time in the morning when I'm greeting kids like, and their families, um, because unfortunately they haven't been able to come into the building for a long time, I always make sure I am listening with ears and eyes wide open. Uh, I have learned over the years about uh, different cultures, their life experiences, the perspectives from asking questions and listening to their stories. I've collected these stories and these moments. I use them um, when I'm at the table advocating for the child or advocating for their family, um, and then also for the important work we do in public education. So this work is important. Um, if I am to hold the responsibility of that second parent. And I need to be sure that I'm doing my very best uh, to continually work to improve school and family collaboration by listening to our families' voices and sharing them on their behalf. Thank you. Oh, so important. Thank you. Kanika. Thank you, Dion, And thank you for having me today. Um, I probably could echo everything that's already been said. I'm definitely noticing the trend through our words. I cannot um, think of a role that I've served in that parents and the relationship between um, the school and the community wasn't at the center of that particular role. Um, here in most recent days, I, I find that I'm serving as the advocate um, for parents by way of revising narratives that we've been writing about them, 
um, in conversations about parents. So I'm these days I'm coaching teachers and I'm coaching principals and I'm leading professional learning. And in those spaces, there are lots of conversations and inferences being made about why and how our parents are showing up and our students are showing up and what that means about their families. And um, some of it may be true, but a lot of it isn't. Um, and one way that we might get to the bottom of that is doing what Sarah suggested, which is having conversations, right? Listening um, and creating spaces uh, for those for for the opportunities to listen to come up. And that's sort of been that's sort of been what's been successful for me as a teacher. In parent conferences, we're not about um, simply relaying where your students were. It was about understanding what's happening with your student at home. Like, what are you noticing? How are you feeling? What are you curious about? Um, and sort of matching that with what I'm seeing in the classroom and partnering to think about what we're gonna do sort of moving forward. Um, and that work continued also in building in the building where I had this really unique um, opportunity to serve as the liaison on the on the parent teacher, so the PTA, and I was also a, a facilitator in the building and my son was in the building. So it was like this really interesting dynamic. And in that seat, I could hear in our planning meetings, what our teachers, what we, the teachers were feeling. And then in the PTA meeting, I could hear what our community was feeling. And there was a distinct mismatch between what we thought was taking place um, and what actually was, what was beautiful about that was to be able to weave in what the needs actually were because I had that unique position, right? So I could help the staff sort of weave in what the actual needs were to begin to build relationships within the community, which I think is at the heart of a successful educational experience. So um, just, just some of those experiences that I've had with it and why I feel like that's super important. Thank you so much, Kanika. And Vidya. Well, thank you. And I uh, just want to share my appreciation um, for, uh, for you to uh, welcoming me into this panel and participating in this great conversation. Um, I come to this work in, at this intersection of family engagement and learning. Um, from my own experience growing up, um, I am the daughter of immigrants from India and who came here in the 70s and had this experience of watching them, even though they were extremely uh, involved in my education, at the same time, they were also there were these very clear disconnects with the school where, you know, it didn't feel like they were totally welcome in the school environment and that there were aspects of my culture and my background that were not welcome in the school environment. And so when I, you know, just see the trajectory in my career, um, you know, going from that childhood experience to seeing now the number of immigrant ch children of immigrants has doubled since when I was a child. And so and, and the, these issues have still not been addressed. Um, families who are uh, you know, raising their children in multilingual uh, households um, and having um, the, you know, these rich contexts to, uh, to provide a, a fantastic educational um, and, learn and, and fostering level of learning, um, the schools are missing a really a incredible opportunity to support children through partnership and collaboration with with the, the richness of what families um, from the, the various diaspora um, of the world are coming to this country with. And it, it, to me, you know, I feel like, you know, what we do at Family Engagement Lab is helping to bridge um, and, and provide these opportunities through really clear communication about what kids are learning in the classroom and how to bring in uh, what families, uh, funds of knowledge at home can bring to bear to help support um, student success, um, both, you know, uh, in the classroom in that moment, but I love this, this idea of like fostering lifelong learning. And so, um, you know, here's a great example, thank you for bringing this up, Dion, of what we do. So we have a service uh, and it, it's which is supported by a texting uh, platform called fast talk and we support um, a number of schools across the country um, to help bridge that communication between families and educators about what kids are learning in the classroom, notably in the family's home language with uh, translation support across the board so that families and teachers can talk together uh, directly about the learning that's happening and we have this fantastic partnership um with uh, illustrative mathematics and also with the partnership for los angeles schools with with michael ramirez and, and the, some of the schools that he's working with um, in la unified uh, to help support this uh this bridge building and 
here's a sample here of, um, of what uh, uh, students can, um, can experience when their parents uh, receive messages like this. So a, a parent would receive text me messages throughout the week um, with fun and fast activities that are aligned with the uh, IM curriculum. Um, as you can see here with prompts for this two way interactions through polls and other types of questions that come throughout the week. And so, um, uh, again, reinforcing that learning and mathematics are everywhere and inviting families into that process in their home language and on a device that every family has. So, so, so important. And I'm just, you know, amazed by this brilliant panel and all the experience that you have to share and all of the learning that's going to take place right now during this webinar. Um, so get your notes out. <laughs> I'm telling you, we have, um, especially in this next question, um, funds of knowledge is defined by researchers, um, Luis Moll, Kathy Amanti, uh, Deborah Neff, and Norma Gonzalez um, in 2001. Uh, it refers to the historically accumulated and culturally developed bodies of knowledge and skills uh, essential for household or individual functioning and well-being. And uh, they claim that by capitalizing on household and other community resources, we can organize classroom instruction that far exceeds in quality the rote-like instruction these children commonly encounter in schools. And my question to you is, do, you, do any of you see evidence of this claim in your experience? Um, and just gonna, oh. Can you guys yeah, see you're unmuted? Yeah, <laughs> if it's okay, I'd love to jump in and get us started if that's okay. Um, because the very first thing that comes to mind is um, a scene in a fourth grade room um, where a teacher was out on maternity leave, sort of in an emergency way. So the planning, there was sort of a disconnect in the planning um, and the students were shocked by the abrupt leaving. And multiplication and division was an issue in the room. Um, I can remember a student being really frustrated about division in particular. Um, and in this particular school, the makeup, the population was about 33% um, Latinx. Um, and this classroom was reflective of that. So we had a large, um, what was what was titled this ESL population, and we had a really wonderful ESL teacher, Miss H, who had this great relationship with the kids. And Miss H was getting married, so Miss H comes into the room on this day with her big wedding binder, which is so Miss H type A, um, and she says, "Turna, I need um, we need to talk about these candles for this wedding. Come see me." So the kids are, um, they're interested, right? Oh, Miss H, hi, Miss H. Um, and I had to tell them what was going on. So in the telling them of what was going on about these packages of candles, the tea light candles that Miss H was getting, um, we enter into this interesting conversation about what her wedding's gonna look like and the tables, what does she need them for? Oh, how many people are sitting there? Oh, how are you helping her? All of these things, right? And we engage in this rich conversation that is embedded with multiplicative reasoning. Um, that we couldn't access prior to, right? And so there was something, so in the moment, when I think back to that, I thought it was about multiplication, right? Like about a context that drew them in. But today in some, like having read more and studied more and learned a bit more, I realized that it was also about the cultural connection between Miss H and this group, right? There was something that drew them in, that invited them in, to this, this particular situation that allowed them to open up, right? It opened up the math to them. Um, and so I think um, that is one example. And if you'll hang with me for one more, another that doesn't involve um, culture per se um, is a little first grader who happened to be working on data in class and went, uh, came in at the end of the week with a chart that she had made in um, and hung on her refrigerator to take count of the missing popsicles that were taking place in the kitchen. So popsicles were disappearing. And so if you, if, you know, twin pops, you pop in half. If you took one side of the twin pop and you ate it, you didn't share the other side and you just put a half an X. But if you had 
if you ate both sides, you put a whole X. And so she came in at the end of the week, like, I got it, I got it. You know, we found out who's been eating most of them and now we can do something about it, right? So that's what we want from math. We want, we want to create these situations where kids see themselves in the mathematics and see a way to connect that math to their world and to use it to solve their problems. So I see both of those sort of real world examples that have happened um, really connected to this particular question. So much joy in those <laughs> examples too, right? Um, Sarah, did you wanna to add to that? Yes, sure. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, nearly the majority of the school I work in have English language learners in it. And um, for us when, and we also have a population where a large percentage are, are brand new to, to English and to the United States. And so often um, we are encouraging our students to respond or um, share with others um, in their own language. And you know, we, we have so many different languages spoken in Portland that we don't have um, a universal bilingual program, but, and, and the teachers don't all understand all those languages or even some of them, but um, a lot of the students in the classroom do, or just the fact that you can tell when a child is, is answering or talking about math in their language and the confidence, you know, they stand up or sit up in their seat a little taller, um, and they feel proud because they're speaking in their language and they're contributing to the class um, in their own thinking and the brilliance that is in their brain already um, in, within from the math lesson that we're doing. So that um, you know, we encourage that. We we may just leave it at that and say thank you. And you know, who else would like to respond? Sometimes we ask um, a classmate to sort of paraphrase what that child said, um, but we also don't want to. Um, say it's not good enough because it wasn't in English either. So uh, that's, it's just, it's just, just right. So that's one of the things, um, making sure that their language is amplified and, and okay to use in school, uh, of course. And then the other, um, the other thing speaking about I am is the launch questions that happen at the beginning of different activities. And one of the questions in kindergarten is about um, getting ready for a meal. So we were asking kindergartners, you know, what, what do you do to get ready for, for mealtime? And so many were talking about making tortillas with their, with their mom. And we, um, you know, we had one of our ed techs um, is a Spanish speaker. And she's like, yeah, but every, you know, every meal there's tortillas. And um, so we, you know, the teacher, the classroom teacher and I didn't necessarily, we didn't know that. Um, it's something we learned from the students. They were very proud to talk about this responsibility that they had and the, um, the work that their moms were doing. And then I took that and later, later that very week, I was working with an older Spanish speaking student and she was having, um, she was struggling with a particular problem. I think it was with multiplication or something. And, um, and I started talking, I'm like, let's, let's talk about tortillas, okay? And we started making the story about that and, and bringing her, you know, I know her siblings. So I was making sure that they were in the story. And, um, and we, had, we built this whole context about um, her, you know, she can visualize her kitchen and her home and her family as she's problem solving through this math. So that, um, that to me is, is really speaks to, that fund of knowledge that our kids have that we need to tap into. And then finally, with um, despite the fact that we were in a pandemic and, and remote learning was, was tricky and challenging, it also was, was a gift in a, in a weird way with having that um, window into, into our, our children's families and their homes and, and theirs into ours um, in a way that we wouldn't expect. And so, so we've we've had that view uh, limited, but certainly there, and and I think that was an experience for educators and for kids. You got to see 
their pets. You got to see their room where they they were happy to share, you know, all the things that they had and, and there was right there with them. So everything was brought into the conversation or into the lesson or went to grab some of those shiny sparkly unicorn things you have there and let's start counting them and stuff like that. So it was um it it was a very, like I said, unexpected but positive outcome of of something that was stressful, but uh, we made it work. So that, um, you know, and, and then I think that's been carried through. Our, our teachers um, have had that, that lens and then we're still bringing things into school now that we're in person and we're able to share and tell those stories and, and refer back to something that happened that we got to see or hear about um, because of that experience. So um, that's, uh, it's, it's just very, it's really important to be sure to get those voices heard from our kids. Um, and, and so that we can incorporate them into our math lessons and throughout the day. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vidya, did you want to add to this? Yes. Um, I just, I'm loving hearing these stories. I think they really resonate um, so much with what we've seen at Family Engagement Lab. And something really stands out, I think that Vanity mentioned um, when you were introducing um, yourself and um, that experience of like helping your child with kindergarten math and how it's like hard to know, you know, what, um, what's appropriate, like what's happening, you know, and, and when we started um, working with families, the thing that we heard the most was, what is my child supposed to be learning right now? And how can I help? And really wanting that information from teachers. Can you so tell uh, something that we've really um, also noticed is that there are a lot of ways that families um, want that type of information and want to have that kind of connection. Um, and it can really vary by the like just the you know the the culture and, and of, of your school setting. And so um, sometimes it, it could be you know just that face to face conversation if that's possible. And but oftentimes you know uh, we've seen like text messaging is really popular with families and particularly um, uh, families who, who are not comfortable in English. Like a text can be really, um, you know, a, a safer way to communicate. It's shorter form and the information can be more accessible, um, both like from a just, oh, there's less to read and there's less to kind of process through. Um, but it's also, you know, there's autocorrect. So if I spelled something wrong, I'll get correct on the other side. Um, and so when uh, we, you know, we designed Fast Talk really for that kind of inclusivity and accessibility, so that when you do share that information about what families are and what, uh, what families should be expecting and what kids are learning in the classroom, that the families can feel welcome and that they can engage in it. And and to answer, I mean, Vicky uh, Rains has a question here about: Do we have data that can point to the impact of this type of communication? Absolutely. And I wanted to highlight that story of why we have that kind of impact is because it's accessible um, and making information accessible to families is what creates the impact. And um, I'll post a link to some of the studies that we've done. But to summarize what we've seen um, with texting is that students, particularly students who are furthest behind their peers, make the most dramatic in case, uh, increases and acceleration of learning up to two to three months even, um, compared to students who are not using Fast Talk. Because when you have ways for families to get involved, there's so much hunger and need for information to support learning once you provide in a way that's really accessible in their home language and is, is not intimidating or not overwhelming it can really make a difference for those kiddos who need it the most. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for sharing that. And the impact is tremendous. And I've seen some of those studies. So thank you for um, um, you know, supporting us with sharing that um, with our audience. Uh, Vanity, do you wanna to add to this? Sure, um, I'll say a couple of things quickly. One, I think funds of knowledge is important in education generally, but specifically when we're talking about math, so many adults have had a negative experience with math that they can't see math all around them. They don't know how math is connected to what you're doing uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. I know we've all seen memes like, when have I used the Pythagorean theorem and, and those types of things because so many of us don't actually, we're not able to 
articulate the ways in which we're using math on a daily basis. And so I think it's incredibly important for us to make it real to students. How, where is math? Where do you see it? It's, it's not as simple as, um, you know, ELA where students can learn their letters and then they learn how to read and it's very um, sequential for families to kind of understand that. And so part of it is that we have to help families as well as our uh, teachers and educators understand that math is everywhere. It Even if you had a bad experience, you are still using math on a daily basis. Um, and so I think that that's critically important when we're thinking about funds of knowledge. Um, and then I'll give you a quick example. So I was working with some teachers um, a while back and the teachers were really struggling with teaching their middle school students fractions. And so, you know, I said, I'll bring some pizza and let's figure this out. Let's figure out how we can um, make sure that you feel more confident about what your students are learning. So I picked up pizza from a local pizza shop where a lot of the students went to. And as soon as I opened the pizza box, the teachers had an aha moment because this pizza place cut the pizza into squares. And so she had been trying to use pizza as an example, but she was, you know, slicing it in a uh, equal way to uh, to illustrate fractions and the kids are all looking at her like I don't know what you're talking about they're not drawing the lines in the same way because their pizza was cut differently and so it's also important for us uh as educators to really understand what is happening in the community to frequent places in the community where our students are coming from so that we're using examples in our lessons that are really connected to um, their own their own communities and their own learning. Such a powerful example of why we need to build our own cultural knowledge of our students. Thank you for that. Um, and for our next question. I'm going to ask Michael to get us started. Um, in your experience, what are some challenges with engaging or collaborating with families? And if you can also think of some advice to give to our um, audience here, that would be amazing. Uh, when I think of current challenges with engaging with families, I, I think it's important that we start by saying that the last two years of pandemic have have left its imprint on everything. Schools, administrators, teachers, families, parents, students, everything. Um, and so it's important that we acknowledge um, that there's a level of fatigue brought about by the last two incredibly challenging years um, where many of our stakeholders have just been trying to survive. Um, and as we think about the unfinished teaching and learning that's been brought about by the pandemic, you know, the stress that's, that, that COVID has put on our families, the issues for students' emotional and social health, as well as the emotional health of our teachers, I think collaboration with families is a, is a greater challenge than it's ever been. So I think we start there, acknowledge the challenge that COVID's had on our work with engaging with families. And as we think about the populations that many of us serve, COVID has disproportionately have impacted our underserved and under-resourced communities, um, as well as our students with diverse needs. Um, and so now more than ever, we in education need to act as partners with our families. Um, as we come out of this pandemic, fingers crossed, you know, fingers crossed that we are actually coming out of this pandemic. Family engagement is totally essential for COVID recovery for our students. Um, in terms of advice, I, I think I'd, I'd want to start with, uh, you know, I just want to focus my advice on what I'd give to teachers. Um, some of my own personal moments of greatest joy as a teacher would be when in the middle of class, uh, a student who was maybe a struggling student showed some measure of growth. You know, I'd stop what I, I was doing. Um, I'd, you know, slam my marker down and I'd call that parent right there um, in front of the whole class um, and thank their parent, you know, for their work with them and, and share with them what they did in class. And, and this not only mot motivated the student, but it also motivated the parent as well. Um, so that's the first thing that I'd suggest to teachers, I guess, and schools, you know, make positive contact with families because you know, if all families are hearing from, from teachers and schools is negative, 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 they're gonna tune out and they're gonna look to avoid us. Um, second piece of advice to teachers um, to improve relationships with families um, would be to affirm and elevate differences in how students show their understanding. Um, many moons ago, um, I, I had a student named Myra who had recently immigrated from Mexico and spoke very little English. She subtracted incredibly accurately in a way that's not common in American education. Uh, for all you math lovers out there, she uh, was using the equal additions uh, algorithm for subtraction. Um, I, I didn't tell Myra that she had to follow the American algorithm. 
Um, I actually talked to her mom and told her that I wanted her daughter to present to the class how she was solving these problems and to help prepare her for presenting to the class. Myra ended up presenting um, her strategy, uh, uh, her way of subtracting, and she did a beautiful job. Um, and her strategy in my class became known for the rest of the year as the Myra way of subtracting. Um, and as a class, we compared the standard American algorithm, the one that they were totally familiar with, and the Myra way, and we had really rich uh, discourse about similarities and differences. Um, a few of my students were so impressed um, with her strategy that they actually decided to adopt the Myra way of subtracting for all subtraction. Um, it, was, it was really amazing to see how Myra encouraged flexibility uh, of thinking for my students. Um, now, this was really significant for Myra as she became more engaged with school after this, and this was a huge turning point for the, the, the mother as well. Um, the mother became super engaged and opened up more conversation and communication with her. So that's the second piece of advice that I give to teachers. Draw on those varying resources of knowledge that exist in our class. Use them for the, the benefit of all of our students and use those varying resources of knowledge to improve partnerships with families. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And we have time for one more example um, or one more response from our panelists. Anyone want to volunteer? Sarah? I'm happy to, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I just along those lines, um, you know, that positive communication, of course, but then make um, that communication or the intention for collaboration meaningful um, and intentional. So, you know, our understanding that our families um, have to take off work in order to to come into our school or come to a meeting and things like that or come to an event um, so making sure that it's student centered um, that it, it showcases the student student work that there's food um, and that it was really worth worth the time um, with with a you know the understanding that our families are busy and um, and repeated, Repeated invitations. I'll speak for myself as a as a working mom. I need to be reminded. Um, and then, of course, having multiple languages and interpreters and folks in um, invited and at there, um, or that notices and information is going home in the languages that are spoken by the families um, that you're that we're reaching. Um, and I just wanted to also say that to build um, the students' excitement as well, we've in, in pre-COVID times when we would host math nights, I would have, um, you know, if you go to a table and you play an activity with your family, you get a ticket and then you can put it in the prize bag and for different prizes that were there, different math-centered activities or games, or it was geometry night, so it was spheres like soccer balls and basketballs and um, all, rectangular prisms of board games and things like that. And so I had the table full of all the prizes for the whole week out for kids to see on their way to lunch and um, come to math night and you, you know, you can win one of these prizes. So then kids were going home and you're really encouraging their families that this is something important. I want to win that basketball. So um, getting kids involved, having them write their own invitations to their families and things like that. Um, so it's, um, those are just some of the things that have been successful for us, but really being thoughtful about the, the time um, that you host different things when you reach families and, and using all sorts of different um, social apps or media in order to, to reach them as well. Yes, um, and oh my goodness, we can continue this conversation forever. I wish we had more time. I, I see Kanika's ready to jump in and Vanity too. Um, we, we do have to continue, but you do have their contact information. And I wanna thank you all so much for our incredible um, discussion. And um, if you weren't taking notes, um, it's fine because it's all recorded. Good for you. Um, one thing I appreciate about our curriculum and about the discussion we just had is that we always center our students. And so let's take some time to hear from some IM students and see how they're experiencing IMK5 math. And this first student, you'll, um, you, may, you may not know this, but this is Vanity Jenkins, lovely first grader, Zoe. Can you tell me why you like math? Because I like asking my family different math questions. Like what? Like, hmm, when I'm 13, 
how will you be? Oh yeah, you like doing those all day. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a mather? Yes. Why? Because math is fun and that's just how I like it. Awesome. Thank you, Zoe. Okay. I think of myself like a math person because I kind of like doing math and it's kind of fun. We use math by um, giving money to to the person like when we when we want to buy something. You always need to do math even if you're cooking. What do you like the most about math, Sophia? That it's fun and entertaining and some and you can learn a lot about it. And do you consider yourself a math person? Uh, sometimes, sometimes not. I'm kind of like a part math person. I like to do a lot of stuff. Yeah, so you think you're part math person, part other kind? Yeah. All right. How does working with a partner or having those discussions, how does that help you become a better mathematician? This helps me become a better mathematician because when we're doing these problems, like sometimes I get stuck and then I have to like figure out and my partner can sometimes like help me like answer this question and since um we're working together like we learn more stuff like let's say I know something my partner doesn't I help her with that and then if I don't know something um she helps me with that and then like after all of like the partner stuff the teacher like explains it better so that grows my knowledge as a mathematician I'm starting to say it's getting easier because it's getting funner because when you start to have something fun and mm -hmm. you're learning about it, yeah. you automatically start to like it more. So much joy in those videos. Um, I can't, um, I don't know. It just touches my soul every time I watch those videos. And I've watched them thousands of times. <laughs> um, but it would not um, be right to end this webinar series without a quote from a poet who has had a huge impact on my family and my life in general, Dr. Maya Angelou, may she rest in peace. Uh, this quote is definitely one to live by. She says, make every effort to change the things you do not like. If you cannot make a change, change the way you have been thinking. You might find a new solution. Throughout this webinar series, we have been highlighting the innovative features of I'm K5 Math and the efforts that we have made to support the shift towards more equitable math instruction, where all students are learning grade level mathematics. If we are to properly tackle issues of racial injustice, the academic language development, and the need to engage and affirm all students by centering their thinking, we, the adults, are going to have to change the way we have been thinking about math instruction. Our curriculum can be a tool for that, but when educators and families use these tools appropriately, we can ensure meaningful instruction for all of our students and create a world where all learners know, use, and enjoy mathematics for life. If you are as excited about uh, I am K5 math as we are, you can learn more about it on our website, illustrativemathematics.org. From there, you can schedule a call with our product specialists or watch our previous webinars on demand. They are all there. You can also join our email list to stay up to date about other exciting events that we'll bring to the IM community. And special thanks to our providers of IMK5 Math, our IM certified uh, partners, Kendall Hunt and Imagine Learning from formerly Learnzillion. And thank you to our senior leadership team, Brandy, Cam, Kate, Mike, Carl, Chris, Kristen, and Bill who continuously lead our organization to achieve its mission. And special thank you to I Am Certified facilitator Robin Moore, technical producer Christy Cavender, K5 author uh, Deborah Parrott for facilitating the Q&A and chat, and our fabulous marketing team for making uh, this webinar series a huge success. Thank you to our fabulous writing team and to our I Am community. It has been an absolute pleasure uh, being your host, and I will be reenacting this image as soon as I sign off today. <laughs> Don't forget to follow us on social media and add the hashtag LearnWithIM when you share your thoughts on Twitter or Facebook. Thank you all.
Have a good day.